chapter 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they'll deliver you up to the councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake and for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up brother to death, the father the child, the children, shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in one city, flee into another. For I shall verily send to you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as he is master, and that the servant as his Lord. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear not them, therefore, for there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, speak you in light. And what you hear in the ear, preach upon the housetop. Fear not them which kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are there not two sparrows sold for a farthing? One of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come, listen to it now, to bring peace on the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword, for I am for I am come to set a man at variance with his father, his daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, he that loseth his life shall, for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receive me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. In another place our Lord said, If any man will be my disciple, let him first deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. The first, the first order after having been born of God, of being a disciple of the Almighty, is to deny ourselves. I want to talk to you about conditions. I, I, I've titled it Conditions and Principles, but it's very seriously doubted that I get beyond the conditions of revival. I want to talk to you this morning. I believe that we stand on the threshold of a book of Acts revival in the coming of the Lord as far as the church is concerned. I, I do not believe that nations perhaps are going to be turned to God, but I believe the church will be the church. And what we see in the book of Acts will be repeated in a group of people on this earth. I want to say first of all, no matter how vital the role of leadership and the rise of a mass movement or a spiritual awakening, there's no doubt that the leader cannot create the conditions which make that movement possible. We, we have led ourselves. I've never saw a thing more clear than the truth that I want to present to you this morning. I believe this church was born to bring revival to this place, ultimately to reach beyond it. 
Now, we're not here as a Sunday school. We're not here to make going to church an end in itself. We're here to know God and to make that God known. And we must be aware that it costs something more than nickels and dimes to make Him known. It costs you your life to make Jesus known in this age in which we're living. A leader, though, cannot conjure the movement out of the void. There has to be an eagerness to follow and obey before the revival can ever be a reality. Now, you hear me closely. There has to be an eagerness on the part of God's saints to follow and to obey before there can ever be such a movement. For this to be, there must be an intense dissatisfaction with the things as they are. Most of the American church sits in a Sunday school, never has the, the time to make it back to church at night. Many of them never go anywhere but Sunday school. They believe that there's a merit award somehow heaven for going to church I want to speak to you this morning ladies and gentlemen there has to be conditions brought about that bring us to an end where our hope is not here where our whole desire is for God when the conditions are not ripe the potential leader, no matter how gifted and holy his cause, will remain without a following. I said he will remain without a following. The Word of God says that the children of darkness are wiser than the children of light. Jesus said that. Now there's two things I want you to note about that. When he said this generation, or when he talks about the children of darkness, wiser in their generation, when he talks about about their generation, what he's talking about is a particular time in history. 1987 is our time in history. And God says the devil knows more about what's going on than the church does. Jesus said it. He said that the children of night are wiser than the children of light. When it comes to discerning what's going on, they, the children of darkness, are quicker to know when the conditions are right for a mass movement. They know more about when the conditions are right. Hell knows that as long as a man is snug in his little niche that you can't disturb him. Just being poor doesn't make it. The abject poverty that grips a lot of people has so, so bound them and frustrated uh, their, uh, and brought them to a place of slavery in their poverty that it's almost impossible to awaken them or disturb them. If there's other factors have to enter in before men are frustrated enough to really want to change. But the devil's crowd knows when it happened. The First World War and its aftermath readied the ground for the rise of the communist, fascist, and Nazi movement. The ground was ready. The devil knew it was right. One young Hitlerite said it wasn't, it wasn't the desolation of an employment that, that disturbed us. It was a nothingness that we saw in front of us, that it was a dead-end street of light, of life. It's there when people arrive, when they lose their faith in the system becoming a utopia, that men turn their hearts to those mass movements, whether they be good or bad. I want to tell you something. The devil is an imitator. He knows nothing but what he stole from the children of light. And the very thing, listen, the very conditions, the very very conditions that were brought out of World War II that brought about these evil movements. Amen. It was those conditions. The world was broke and desperate at the close of World War I. Men in Europe with the war lost had no hope. But let me tell you, had that war, World War I, been averted or even delayed for a decade, the fate of Mussolini, Hitler, and Lenin 
would have been the same as many brilliant revolutionaries and bloggers of the 19th century who never succeeded in a full-scale mass movement, never were able to produce the revolution. Why was this so? Because the European masses, up to the cataclysmic events of the First World War, had not utterly despaired of the present and therefore were not willing to sacrifice the present for the future. There's never been a true believer that didn't arrive at the place that he was willing to sacrifice this present for the future. That's the reason the Bible said it's in the hope of the coming of Christ that the church is made strong, not in the prosperity mess that's preached when you deal with selfish desires. You have missed that men will not die for a better job. No, sir. They'll not die for a better job. It is when, it is when we despair of the present that we're willing to die for the new. For the new. Listen. The same conditions that bred and birth the evils of communism, fascism, and Nazism are absolutely essential for worldwide revival. If you don't hear anything else, I say you hear me now. They are absolutely essential for revival. You, you take middle class America with everything going as it has, it's being disturbed now. But for a lot of years, amen, he was steady on his job. He could get a new car every other year. He could air condition his home. Any change that came about, mister, was a deterioration. He never saw the kingdom of God. If you ask him to vote for heaven or where he was, 90% of them would vote for here. The loss, the loss, the loss was the loss of a desire to be with God. Amen. Things took the place. Self became the God of the 20th century church. That's the reason the prosperity message gained such a hold in the Pentecostal circles. I was in Fort Worth preaching a funeral on a Friday and the pastor there with me, Brother Jones, he said, I move around very little, but if what I hear is happening in the Assembly of God's churches in and around this metroplex is true, we have lost it. He said, Brother Clinton, and they're having square dances in the church, round dances in the church. Let me tell you when this church has to appeal to you in that direction. This church has lost God and is not fit to sit here on this corner as a church. And I have to have a baseball team to make this church interesting. Then this church is not fit to be a church. Amen. I'm not saying that these young people can't have a good time. And I'm telling you, there'll never be a day that a night of baseball will take the place of a night of prayer in this church. You hear me? The same conditions that birth those evils are an absolute necessity for worldwide revival. It's not the evil of darkness and the disruptiveness of society that hinders revival. You listen, I know we draw into a shell and we're frightened at what we see with a pornography that's blared openly on the television that the loss of any moral sense that grips a church and the world. I can tell you, I grew up in a little community of 500 people that had higher moral ethics than the average Pentecostal church has in 1987. I look at the nakedness displayed among those that claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I see them standing in line at movie theaters. I can tell you, they've lost something in their lives. They've lost something. And that something is what must be brought back by conditions. Listen, it's not the evil. It's not the darkness. 
It's not the disruptions that hinder revival. It is the natural good, the tranquility, and the peace and prosperity that hinders a real move of God. You listen to all the message you're hearing. I know I'm cutting a cross grain, but I can tell you when I came to this city and the average wage was about $75 a week, I had a much larger crowd on a Sunday night than I had on a Sunday morning because man wasn't thinking of a bigger automobile. He was thinking of the Almighty. His spirit was turned towards spiritual things. Amen. Whether we want to believe it or not, it is God that allows the conditions. I look at the deterioration of this nation. The Bible said the nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. I can tell you this nation has been turned into hell. He's not talking about a lake of fire, but the home is hell. The street is hell. The government's hell. You look at that soap opera they got going on television today. Amen. In an effort to stop us from being against the enemy that would destroy us. I can tell you it's been turned into hell because it forgets got God. That's what the problem is in this hour. It's God that allows the condition. You read the Bible in secular history and you will find that every spiritual awakening in history has come on the heels of a moral midnight. It's when everything was lost that an angel stepped outside of Jerusalem and killed 185,000 Syrians. It was then that Ezekiel's re or Hezekiah's revival. It's when everything is lost. When the city is him. The food supplies cut off and he knelt at the altar of God that a revival came. It's never came out of a tranquil society. It's when the present seems to be almost gone that men turn to something higher. Calvary came on the heels of a moral midnight. You hear me? The darkest night in human history was the night of the greatest revival. When, when a chain was wrapped around hell and Satan was dragged across the universe as Jesus died for the sins of the world. The darkest time in human history was at Calvary. You read all through in history. When, when, the, when the Wesleyan revival sprung up, it was a time on the heels of the French Revolution and it looked like all of Europe was going to face the same. It was in those dark moments that God moved in. I said that God moved in. Why is this so? Because men never plunge headlong into an undertaking of vast change until they're intensely discontented with the present. Amen. You listening to me? The reason revival comes in the dark times is that you can't move people until their hopes are swept away. As long as we have a hope in the system in which we live, as long as we believe that somewhere we're going to produce some kind of a millennium in ourselves, then there'll never be a real revival. It is when men lose hope in the present that they begin to look and are willing to move into conditions of vast change. God never sent Moses to Egypt to deliver the people until they lost all hope of reform in Egypt. Never sent them. They've been there 430 years when the man of God came to deliver them. It took 400 years plus to break them dissatisfied with a system to where they're willing to follow, to obey. You can't have revival till that happens, folks. I said you can't have a revival until those conditions reach those points. God knew it. Amen. When he sent Moses, then there's a frustration set up. They're demanded of them the impossible. There seems to be absolutely no hope, none whatsoever. But out of it came a man. He rose up. Listen, the leader can come. Moses could have went a hundred years earlier and he'd never have attracted a following. He may have with his miracles made Pharaoh know they ought to leave, but getting the slaves to leave was going to be the big part. And if he had got there a hundred years earlier, they would never have left Egypt. I can tell you, church, I believe the time is ripe in America for revival. The time is ripe in this nation. 
in this nation. God never sent him until men reach the point spiritually that, they, that nothing has its roots uh, and, and reason in self can be of any eternal value. They are not ready for revival. I said they're not ready for revival until they reach the point that everything that has its roots in self they recognize to be of absolutely no value to God. Then, then they are not ready until God can bring them. I came to this city 31 years ago in November. I can remember like it was yesterday. We were getting uh, $25, $30 a week, sometimes a little more, but not enough to take care of what we owed and what we needed, except God help us. One Monday morning, fairly desperate about finances, I went to that little tin church and walking back and forth praying. I mean, everywhere, every other month I had to appear before the sectional council. They didn't want us here for some reason. I don't know why. Amen. But we went through the ordeal always on the inside. And on the outside, there was a pressure of finances. And that morning at 4.30, walking in that little tin building, I said to God, I, I don't know how I can make it on what I'm getting, but if it's your will that I be here, then I, I can make it, whatever it is. If you don't give a quarter, I can make it. I can make it. And he spoke to me that morning nearly 31 years ago. And he said, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you in this place. I have put you here to restore the message of Pentecost. He may have said it to a thousand others. But I'm here to tell you this morning, he spoke that to me 31 years ago, almost 30 and a half years ago. He spoke that to my heart. And for, and for these 30 years and several months, we, we have seen inside of these walls somewhat of a revival. We've witnessed. People have come and said among us and said, wish we had. We thought we was backslid, but they thought we was in a revival. For 30 years we've witnessed a move of God, but it's been confined to this place. You know why? There was something missing. The golden triangle was very prosperous. Everything was fine. They had no time for God but a Sunday morning. There's no desire for change. I can tell you, mister, that's all past history. It's a different thing going on. I said there's a different something taking place. Been a dozen times that I felt that I ought to leave. I've left crowds of three, 4,000 people on a Friday night to come back here to preach on a Sunday. Amen. Somehow could never get released because that which we was called to do has never become the reality that it's about to come. Amen. I can tell you theologically, I know what it is. I said theologically, I know what it is. But that message must be restored in a living way. We've reduced it down to a little Methodist chant. But I'm telling you, this thing is Pentecostal. It is birth Pentecostal. It'll be raptured Pentecostal. The end will always go to the beginning. And it's not going to be a game of men playing with the gifts of God. It's going to be a holy people walking in the will of God, willing to die for what they believe. <laughs> when a revival begins to attract people who are interested in their individual careers, it's a sign it's lost its vigor. When I watch the politics taking place among us, I know we've lost the vigor. If it isn't recovered, we're going like all other people went. When I say we, I'm talking about the Pentecostal organizations. When I see the politics that are there and, and, the, and the scrambling for the top position, when politics become a part of it, when we're attracting people who are engaged uh, in their own careers, who are interested, it's a sign that has lost its vigor. At this point, it's no longer engaged in the molding of a new race and a new world, but it's, but it's possessing and preserving the present it's no longer a movement it becomes an institution and it's not worthy of the name of God 
not worthy of the name of God. Jesus, listen, if any man be my disciple, let him first deny himself. In these words, Jesus set forth the only path that leads to the kingdom of God. You can sit around and pamper folks if you like, but this book is saying the Lord of glory said it, that if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to deny yourself. I'm going to talk to you now. Amen. I said I'm going to talk to you. If any man will be my disciple, that's the only pathway, young people, to the place of the kingdom of God. It isn't the pampering that's being brought on by the message and theology that's preached today. It's a message of death to something and alive to something else. It's a message of everything being God. Oh, this is an age when we have produced in the church so many independent thinkers. Amen. That the church sits on a pew with a half a dozen tapes going a half a dozen different directions. I can tell you that it is a possession of absolute truth that gives gives men the power to tread on scorpions, mister, walk over the devil. He who knows Jesus knows the reason for everything. Any man will be my disciple. Let him deny himself. The vigor of a revival of spiritual awakening stems from the propensity of the saints for united action and self-sacrifice. Did you hear me? I said the vigor of a revival, spiritual awakening, whatever you want to call it, stems entirely from the propensity of the saints for united action and self-sacrifice. Amen. Listen, the devil stole this. They worship right over there. They worship right over that. We talked about a double tithe once a week, a once a month, a double tithe in the financing of a new building. Across there, every Saturday they meet, and 20% of every dime they make is given to it. 20%. Amen. They don't worry whether they're on Social Security or not. If they made 80 cents, then they're going to give uh, 16 cents of it in the offering. Amen. You see, let me tell you something, folks. The, the vigor of a movement in its, is in its propensity for united action and self-sacrifice. It doesn't come anywhere else. Amen. It's always the willingness for self-sacrifice is brought about by our becoming a part of something we perceive to be greater than ourselves. I've got to say that again to you. The willingness for self-sacrifice is brought about by our becoming part of something we perceived to be greater than ourselves. I said a few moments ago on the way in that morning, that December morning, 1941, when the President of the United States said on that radio that we have been bombed, we are in war with Japan. Fifteen minutes later, I walked into the living room, which was also a bedroom of the home where we lived, and said to my mother, I'm going to go over to the driller's house and tell him I'm quitting my job. She hadn't heard the radio. She said, why? I said, we're at war. The president said, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. You know, I look back all these years later, amen, some 45 years later, I look back that moment I lay my life down. Down. I was able, God let me live, but I've walked across those that died by the thousands because they believe that this country was worthy of their lives. Amen. They perceive they were a part of something bigger than we, and there'll never be a revival until I come to the place and you come to a place that I believe the church is worth living and dying for, whatever it costs me. never be till that time comes long as we sit here and play church that world's our friend but the once those tables turn is what I read to you becomes true again then you will die for what you believe amen 
Robert's statement a few weeks ago here, a few Sunday nights, maybe last Sunday night. He said, this cause right here, this church must become the center and the circumference of our lives. The book of Acts revival will be repeated when we arrive at the point that we have no purpose worth our destiny apart from Christ's collective body. Until I come to that place, I have no worth, I have no purpose, I have no destiny apart from the church and the purpose of the living God. Never a man utterly without a sense of belonging, mere life in itself is all that matters. Mere life to such a man, his only reality is an eternity of nothingness, and he clings to it with shameless despair. He clings to it. That man that lives for himself, that man that can see 300 million people perish, 3,000 million people rather perish without the gospel, and won't give to that cause, lives for himself. I said he lives for himself. He faces an eternity of nothingness. And when the crunch comes, I'm going to show you that he'll break under the load. I said he'll break under the load. Amen. The capacities for united action and self-sacrifice always go together. If you ever heard a preacher hear me this morning, there's people in this audience that God has ordained that we produce a move of God. Amen. Unequaled in this generation. Unequaled in this generation. The capacities for united action and self-sacrifice go together. Jesus, the school, his disciples for united action, he readied them for acts of self-denial. You hear me? To school them for united action, for total agreement with himself. He readied them through a school of self-sacrifice. And the man that can't be led down that road will never know nothing of the kingdom of God. I said he'll never know anything of the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus knew that the man who practices self abnegation slows off the hard shell which keeps him apart from others and is thus made a simmable material. He can be lost in that body. He's not out there to gain a name for himself but he's a part of the whole. Being the foot he doesn't say he's a hand. Amen. But he's that man that practices self-denial that slips off that shell that keeps him from being a part of something worthwhile in life. Jesus knew that that. And so his first words were, if you'll be mine, you'll deny that one. You'll deny that one. Every unifying factor, therefore, is a promoter of self-sacrifice. And every act of self-sacrifice is a promoter of unity. I said it's a promoter of unity. Listen, Jesus made it clear, made it very clear. To prepare his followers for a willingness of martyrdom which they had to face, they would ultimately face, Jesus separated them from their individual selves by assembling them into his own purpose and cause. Into his own purpose and cause. Amen. He made it clear that the cause for which we give ourselves would bring division. I read it to you. Mother against daughter, daughter against mother, father against son, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. But he made it clear that if you love that mother or that dad more than you do him, you're not worthy of this. You must be willing, if necessary, to walk off and leave the children, to walk off and leave the husband. If that comes to that, this cause must be what motivates and dominates my life. I know, I know the, the religious world don't like to hear what 
I'm saying? I'm telling you it is here and here alone that revival becomes a reality. I'm well aware that the devil knows this process and has used it for evil. Hence all the cults of religion and government. I'm going to tell you again, he's an imitator. I said he's an imitator. Jesus said you can't serve yourself and God. He said that with the money. He said you can't serve God and mammon if you can't support the gospel. Then you hate God and you ought to declare where you are. Jesus said it. I'm not telling you that here the devil uses, he's an imitator. He uses the things of God to promote his own. As the church in this end time once more becomes the church, the body of Christ, the vehicle of expression. As she does, she'll once again face the hostility and hatred of the world. It's easy today. It may not be easy tomorrow. There's factors everywhere in this humanistic world we live in now that wants to do, to do away with God. They hate God. Amen. I said they hate God. I made mention here on a Wednesday night. My message was simply God. I just dealt with the subject of God. Amen. And in that subject, I was saying how that the United States government made an independent survey of the work of the Teen Challenge in this nation. And they concluded after a nationwide study, and I think $5 million they spent in the study, they concluded that 87 to 93 percent were successful deliverances. That 90 or 87 to 93 out of every 100 drug addicts, homosexuals, or whatever else entered that teen challenge come out a free person. In their own report, they said less than 2 percent of the average a neurological center, anything else ever delivers a person, but yet thumbs down, they turn down God. You know why? Self is their God. And to allow that to stand was to crucify their own. All I'm saying is they hate God. And once we express God, that hatred's going to come back. I said that hatred's going to come back. Amen. You must understand that the reason for the hatred is the God of this world is self that Jesus said had to be denied. Amen. That's the hatred. They allow you. If you allow self to live, then they accept the church on those grounds. But the hatred against that church is because that self that's their God that Jesus said had to be crucified must be denied. The world crucified our Lord, but they'll not stand by willingly and let us crucify their God. Self. S-E-L-F. As we move toward the image of Christ, we crucify the self. The world's God. Persecution follows. Persecution follows. You hear me? As we move toward that image, persecution follows. And in that persecution, it's the people that stand that will ultimately be saved. I want to tell you something, bringing this down to a wire. The capacity to stand stems in a great part from the individual's identification to some group. But that his capacity to stand in the face of the hell that's thrown at him stems mostly from his identification with what he perceives to be a holy cause. The church is that cause. The body of Christ is that cause. Amen. It is that cause. The people who stood up best in the Nazi concentration camps were those who felt themselves members of a compact group. I remember reading the book of Corrie Ten Boom and her sister. 
how they stood in that awful time because they belonged to something. They were not alone. They never faced those tormentors alone. Amen. That person that's a member of the body of Christ, though stranded on a desert or in the mid-ocean, he's never alone. I said he's never alone. That is a capability of being able to stand, young people. You hear me? Listen. The capacity came from that. The individuals, whatever their nationality, caved in. Amen. They caved in. The Western European Jew proved to be the most defenseless. Amen. Spurned by the Gentiles, even those in the concentration camp, and without vital ties to a Jewish community, he faced his tormentors alone. Amen. He faced them alone. One realizes now that the ghetto of the Middle Ages was more of a fortress for the Jew than it was a prison. The sense of unity imposed by the ghetto gave the Jews strength to stand and endure the unbroken with unbroken spirit the violence and abuse of those dark centuries. Amen. It was because he was a part of something. Thank God there was a community forged in that ghetto by the circumstances. Amen. It was, it was that. You read the history of the civil rights movement and it was those caught in the south that were able to stand more than there were those that seemingly had broke out of that church in the north. You hear me? It is when we are part of a cohesive whole. I'm a part of Christ, mister. Whatever you do to me, you do to Christ. I belong to something that's eternal. And as long as that body lives, I will live no matter what happens. I will live. It is being a part of something. That one that hops here and hops there and never a part of anything. Or he may sit in it but never a part because of the selfishness of his own spirit will be crushed I said he'll be crushed when the Middle Ages returned for a brief decade in our day under Hitler. They caught the Jew without his ancient defenses and crushed him. When England, when the British colonized in Palestine looked at the six million Jews subdued by Hitler, they thought they'd have no problem subduing the 600,000 in Palestine. But it's a different Jew. I said, it's a different Jew. In, in, in Hitler's Europe, he had to face the devil alone. There wasn't that cohesive community. But in Palestine, they were molded by the Jewish unity. And they crushed the British. I said, they crushed the British. It is that cohesiveness of belonging that's going to cause us to endure. Jesus said, he that endures, the same shall be saved. He that endures. The conclusion is that when the individual faces, faces torture and annihilation, he cannot rely on the resources of his own individuality. When Elijah thought he was alone, he caved in. When he thought he was alone, I'm the only one left. And it was at that point that the man of God began to crumble. Our only source of strength, listen to me, our only source of strength is not being ourself, but sort of something mighty, something glorious, something indestructible. Something indestructible. Faith then is primarily a process of identification. I said, faith then, if my victory after being saved is that I'm a part of something bigger than I am, then faith primarily is a process of identification, a process by which the individual ceases to be himself and becomes part of something eternal. Let me tell you something. Ladies and gentlemen, we move toward a close of an age. The church he returns for is not going to be on a Sunday school picnic. They're going to be a people that have given themselves to a cause that they perceive willing and worthy 
to die for. Self-sacrifice has always been a part. If you, any man, will be my disciple, then he must first deny himself. As long as you live for self, you can never be assimilated into a body with a single purpose. You can never be assimilated. So Jesus said, when you deny yourself, you slough off that hard shell that prevents you from becoming a part of others and himself. The conditions for revival are ripe. There's a frustration in the land. The new poor present the frustration more than the chronically unemployed. Men that have had jobs for years now suddenly can't find it. There's a frustration out there that's ripe for the subversive of the reality. The church must be the church. Offer that man, that woman, hope in trying times. Hope in desperate times. To be a part of a system that's forever. Bow your heads with me.